In the last section of the book, we dealt with the easiest kind of differential equation. In fact, they're so easy, they barely deserve to be called differential equations. We looked at differential equations of the form dy dx equals some function of x. And this just means y is an antiderivative of f of x. And our notation for finding an antiderivative was to write this curly s, this integral sign, and write f of x here and dx. This just means anti-differentiate f of x with respect to x. So it's whatever you write between the integral sign and the dx. Um, and so all of our differentiation rules yield anti-differentiation rules. And we looked at those in the last section. In this section, we want to look at kind of the next hardest kind of differential equation. And that's where you have, so that's where you have a separable equation. Separable means that you can solve by separation of variables. And what that means is that your differential equation is in the form some function of x times some function of y. This is all it means to be a separable differential equation. And um, you solve these kind of, well, by finding two antiderivatives. Let me say what happens most of the time, and then we'll have to do some examples to, to actually see what, where problems lie. But the way you normally do this, you divide both sides by g of y. Of course, this requires that g of y is not 0, which is, which is a problem sometimes. And so you get this equals f of x. Then you anti-differentiate both sides with respect to x. So you have this. So I anti-differentiated both sides with respect to x. So this just means anti-differentiate with respect to x. This combined with that means anti-differentiate this with respect to x. But then the chain rule, or in its integral form, as we talked about in the last section, uh, substitution, tells you that it's, these things behave as though the dx's cancel. This is just an antiderivative of g of y with respect to y, or 1 over g of y with respect to y. And so you solve this by calculating this antiderivative with respect to x and this antiderivative with respect to y. Um, this will typically leave you with some, um, some fairly complicated function of y equals some function of x. And at that point, if you can explicitly solve for y algebraically, you do. If you can't explicitly solve for y, you just leave your answer in implicit form that some function of y equals some function of x. There's one other thing I should say before we do an example, and that's that because we end up with this antiderivative equaling this antiderivative, it's convenient, and this is the way everyone talks about it, and the way I will talk about it from now on, but you need to understand we're being slightly or fairly sloppy here. It's just that we know how things are going to turn out. What everyone would say here that's worked with these for a while is, Divide both sides by g of y and multiply by dx. And then they would just write this equals f of x dx. Now, we've used differential notation. And it's fine if you want to interpret it that way, that this is some independent variable now. But that means you didn't exactly get this by multiplying both sides of this by dx. And it, I don't know, it wouldn't lead you to put integral signs in front of both sides. However, because that's the way things end up, we go ahead and write this intermediate step, um, either because we think it's fine with the differential notation, or knowing that the chain rule, or integration by substitution, tells us that this is right 
after we put the integral signs in. So we do talk about this, getting this by divide both sides of the equation by g of y, multiply by dx to get the equality of these differentials, and then you put in the integral signs. All right, so that's how you talk about these. Let's, let's do an example. It'll be, should make things very clear. So let's look at the example we used in section one on, in the first section on differential equations. Um, dA dt equals t times a squared. All right. In the first section in this chapter, we just had to be handed the solution to this. But now we want to see how you produce the solutions. Um, so what do you do? This equation is separable. It's in the form dA dt, so the derivative of the dependent variable with respect to the independent variable equals some function of t times some function of a. So it's separable. We can divide both sides by a squared and multiply by dt. No. Um, but you do have to worry about where a is zero. So let's, the, the way this really goes is you say either either a a squared equals zero or a squared is not zero. And if a squared is zero, um, so or a is unequal to zero. Now, a is a function of t. So do I mean equals, or do I mean for all t or for some t? Well, um, I'll make that clear. But right now, let's suppose that a is always zero as a a squared is always zero as a function of t. That means that a, a itself is zero. Well, then that is, an e that is a solution to this differential equation. The function, the constant function, a equals zero, then is a solution to this. Why? Because the derivative of a constant is zero, and if capital A is zero, then certainly A squared is zero, so this side is zero. This is a solution. It's called an equilibrium solution, one of these constant where A is constant. This is called an equilibrium solution. Um, Okay, so there's the equilibrium solution. Suppose you're, you don't have the equilibrium solution. Well, then, then a squared is not zero somewhere. Right? If a isn't always zero, then there's somewhere where it's not zero. And since a squared is a continuous function, if it's not zero somewhere, it's not zero on a whole interval containing that. So what we do is we break this up into two cases where a is always zero, or you assume you're on an interval where a is never zero. So now we assume, so now we're in the case or a is not zero. And I mean that it's not zero at any value of t in some open interval where we're going to get a solution. And that's what you always assume here, that you're looking on open intervals where this function a squared is not zero, the function you're dividing by. So so now we assume this, and then we do the division. We divide both sides by a squared, we multiply by dt, and we get this. And then you integrate both sides. All right, so we need an antiderivative of t, but use the power rule for integration. So you get, you add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. I'll put in a plus c. We'll also have a plus, C, uh, a plus C2 because I'm going to have a, a constant over here too. How do you anti-differentiate 1 over A squared? Well, it's the power rule. You write this as A to the minus 2. And then, yeah, use the power rule. You add 1 to the exponent, 
and divide by the new exponent. I'll put a plus c1 here. So you have these two constants. Well, we don't want two constants. So what you immediately do is subtract c1 from both sides. And I'll write this as negative a inverse equals t squared over 2 plus c2 minus c1. And then you group those together. Well, c1 and c2 were just arbitrary constants. They could be anything. So c2 minus c1 is just some constant. And we might as well just call it c. The whole c2 minus c1, just call it c. It could be anything. The moral of the story is that if you've got one indefinite integral equal to another indefinite integral, you put a plus c on one side or the other, but not on both. If you put it on both, you can immediately subtract it and group them together and call it just c, call c2 minus c1 or c1 minus c2 c. Um, I tend to put the arbitrary constant on the side with the independent variable. Sometimes it might be nicer to have it on the other side. So we, we're here. Um, as I said, if, if this integral comes out very complicated in terms of a, then you just have to leave your answer in implicit form. If we had some ugly function of a over here, and we couldn't solve algebraically easily for capital A. But we can solve this one algebraically easily, so we will. Uh, if you leave it like that, it's called the implicit solution. In what sense is it a solution? Well, there are no derivatives and no integrals left, so it's, uh, it's an algebra problem. But we have minus a to the minus 1 equals t squared over 2 plus c. Multiply both sides by minus 1. And we get a to the minus 1 equals minus t squared over 2. And then you get minus c. And now I need to let you remind you of something that um, we've seen. It's that c had no meaning for us. It's just some constant. So yes, negative c. It's some new constant. Um, it's not, you know, it's... But it's just a constant, even with the minus sign. And the tendency is just to write plus c again, where this c is not the same as that c. This new c would be negative the old c. Now, you can just keep the minus sign around, or you can, you know, uh, it does get a little cumbersome if you had like, multiplied by 102 or something. Instead of writing 102c, we just write c over and over again. Um, so you, you kind of need to get used to this. It goes on all the time. Um, in fact, we're going to mess with C one more time before we're finished. So we'd like to solve for A. This is A to the minus 1. So A is 1 over that. It's this. It's important that it's 1 over this entire sum. You don't just take 1 over this part and then add a c. It's 1 over the entire sum. Um, uh, a fraction in, in the denominator of this fraction is kind of aesthetically unpleasing. You don't have to do what I'm about to do, but I like multiplying the numerator and denominator by 2 to get 2 over. And then you, this 2 would cancel with that one. You get a minus t squared. And then you get plus 2c. But c has no meaning for us. So it's just some, 2c would just be some real number just like c was. So we just usually call it c again. And so what we find are that the solutions to dA dt equals ta squared, well, there are two kinds of solutions. There's the equilibrium solution. A is, as a function of t is 0. And then there's the other solutions, which are all of this form. Okay. And we are um, really, with this solution, you only use this on intervals, on intervals of t, where a does not hit the equilibrium solution, where a squared is not 0. Right? So we don't want a to be 0. Um, it's sometimes true that the solution you produce extends through these places where this function hits zero. Uh, that's fine. Then you have a solution defined on a bigger open interval 
but it, the bigger, you know, bigger meaning on an open interval that even contains t values where a squared is zero. That's fine, um, but the solution needn't be unique as you go across there. So it's, um, you only definitely get that, that you have such a solution on an open interval where A does not hit the equilibrium solution of zero. Okay, um, all right. Why don't we look at another example of separable, uh, why don't I state generally what you do and, and after this example and then we'll look at another one. So what I've just said is supposed to make it clear that there are two kinds of solutions to differential equations, uh, separable equations, that you need to look for. So um, when you're solving dy dx equals some function of x times some function of y, um, there are two kinds of solutions. Ah, to know that antiderivatives exist, we will need, it, it's a theorem, um, it's really part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we will assume f of x and g of y are continuous. Um, this, at least, you know, on the intervals where we're saying the differential equation applies. Um, that's to guarantee that antiderivatives exist. Then there are two kinds of solutions. One, you have the equilibrium solution. So where g of y is zero, um, uh, if y naught is such that, so it's a, a root of g is such that g of y naught equals zero, then y equals y of x equals the constant function y naught is a solution, an equilibrium solution. Right? Because if g of y naught is zero, then, then what? Then the function that's constantly y naught, its derivative is certainly zero. And yeah, if y is the con function that's constantly y naught, then over here you'd have g of y naught, this is zero. So yeah, you've got zero equals zero, so this is a solution. And then there's two, if, you know, if g of y is not zero on an interval. Then you get the implicit solution that an antiderivative of 1 over g of y with respect to y equals the antiderivative of f of x with respect to x. So what you get if you divide both sides by g of y, multiply b by dx, and integrate. So there are two distinct kinds of solutions, and you could have a problem, as, as, we, as I just mentioned in the example, when you, when you get this solution, if you can solve explicitly for y, you may see that that function y, that that solution, extends very nicely across intervals that would make g of y equals zero, so where you'd hit an equilibrium solution. Um, that's true. It may, but then if it does, then the solution may not be unique as you extend across there because the equilibrium solution also exists. Of course, this might agree with the equilibrium solution, um, so then there wouldn't be a problem. All right, uh, let's look at an example where there is a problem. Um, let's look at, this is another example we've already looked at where, at least for some initial conditions, the solution is not unique, but let's, let's look at
dy dx equals y to the two-thirds. And we'll give ourselves an initial value problem. We'll say that when x is 0, y is some value y naught. OK, well, how do you solve, how do you find the general solution of this differential equation? First, you look for the equilibrium solutions. Any place that y to the two-thirds is 0, that's where y is 0. So there's an equilibrium solution. y equals y to the x is always 0, or y of x is always 0. So the function that's always 0 satisfies this. Of course, if your initial y value is not 0, then this won't be a solution to this initial value problem. But I'm ignoring the initial condition temporarily and getting the general solution. And then, aside from the equilibrium solution, you assume that y is not 0. You divide both sides by y to the 2 thirds, or what's the same thing? Multiply by y to the minus 2 thirds. Multiply both sides by dx. You'd be left with 1 over here times dx. So you get this. And then you integrate both sides. Um, this is just 1 times dx. This is y to the two, minus 2 thirds. You integrate using the power rule for integration. So you add 1 to the exponent. Get positive one third divided by one third equals x plus c. Multiply both sides by a third, you get y to the one third equals one third x plus one third c, but c has no meaning for us, so we'll just call it c again. And then you cube both sides. And so you find the solution y equals one-third x plus c quantity cubed. It's important that the plus c is inside the parentheses. It's cubing this and adding c cubed is not the same as adding c and cubing the quantity. So we get two kinds of solutions. This, equilibrium solution at zero, and this. So these together form the general solution to the differential equation. But what about the initial condition? So these are not solutions to that initial value problem, necessarily. It depends on what y naught is. So what do you do? So we had two kinds of solutions. The equilibrium solution, that's always 0. And then this other solution, other form of the solution, which is 1 third x plus c quantity cubed. Great. That's the general solution to the differential equation. But suppose now we have the initial condition. y sub y 0 is y naught. Well, this breaks up into two cases. Not surprisingly, because dy, because there are two cases there. But I remind you the differential equation is dy dx equals y to the two thirds. <coughs> Case one. Suppose y naught is zero. Okay. Then which of these things? So here, are what all our solutions look like. Um, Suppose y naught equals 0. Well, then this is certainly a solution to the differential equation. So solution or to the initial value problem. Solution to the initial value problem. I'm allowing for the possibility there's more than one. Well. So there's certainly the equilibrium solution because it satisfies this initial condition. Um, this, this solution, we produced it by assuming that y was not 0. And yet, certainly the solution, the, the function exists. Um, the function exists and can give you y equals 0 without 
causing the, pro the function a problem. But if we want when x is 0, y is 0, we just need c to be 0. So if you want, can you let this y be 0 and find a value for c? Yes. Um, so you get 0 equals 1 third times x at 0 plus c cubed. So you need c to be 0. And if c is 0, then y is x cubed over 27. Is this really a solution to the initial value problem? Well, it certainly satisfies the initial data, right? When x is 0, y is 0. And because of how we found it, you can, I mean, you can double check, but certainly if you take its derivative, if you take dy dx and you raise y to the 2 thirds, you do get the same function of x. So yes, this is a both of these are solutions to the same initial value problem. The solution is not unique. Um, why, why is that able to happen? Well, because we, kind of, we, we produced a unique solution, that the solution had to be this, on an interval where y isn't 0. But now we let y hit 0, and the function is perfectly well defined, and now it gives us an extra solution where y, I mean, that bumps into the equilibrium solution. Um, so yeah, there are, these are two solutions to the initial value problem. In fact, there are more solutions to the initial value problem um, if y0 is 0. Why? Well, because we can take pieces of these two solutions. We could also take the function y is 0 if, if x is less than or equal to 0, and x cubed over 27 if x is greater than or equal to 0. I'm allowed to include the case equals 0 both places because when x is 0, this is 0, and this is 0. Um, this certainly satisfies the initial condition. Um, it's also true that it'll satisfy the differential equation. There might be some question in your mind as to whether this function is actually differentiable when x is 0 because it's defined in, in pieces, but it is. Um, and I won't verify that, but it is, and so this is another solution. Or we could take x cubed over 27 first, and then 0. So there are at least four different solutions to this initial value problem. Um, y of 0 equals 0, and dy dx equals y to the 2 thirds. Okay. What about if y0 is not 0? Well, then surely we're okay there. Well, yes and no. It depends on what you mean. So, suppose we've got this. Same differential equation. But y at 0 equals some y0 that's unequal to 0. Well, let's, let's just pick a specific one so that the example will be more clear. Let's suppose we pick 1. Then, surely we get a unique solution to the, to the separable differential equation. Yeah, sort of. So, if you take y equals... So, we know that there are two kinds of solutions to the differential equation. This one and this one. This certainly doesn't satisfy the initial condition. So, you know, this cannot be a solution to this initial value problem. That means we have to have a solution of this form, and we put in that when x is 0, y is 1, and we get 1 equals x is 0, we get 0 plus c cubed, so c cubed is 1, so c equals 1. And you get y equals 1 third x plus 1 cubed. Great. So there's the unique solution to our differential equation, or to our initial value problem. Is it really unique? Well, phew, yeah, this one doesn't satisfy that initial condition. Yeah, but maybe we could use this some places and this other places. And this seems ridiculous to do. 
And yet the whole point is, well, part of the point, is that solutions to differential equations are only, you only expect them to be good, or you're kind of happy if, <laughs> if you can find a unique solution. You're happy if you can find a unique solution near the initial data. So near where x is 0, this is certainly the unique solution. There's an open interval around x equals 0 in which this is the only solution to that initial value problem. Um, but if you let x get too big, how big? So that this runs into the, this equilibrium solution. So if you let x be negative 3, Right? Suppose you take this function. When x is negative 3, y is 0, which is the equilibrium solution. Does that cause a problem? It depends on what you mean by a problem. So here's, here's the real number line. And we're given an initial condition when x is 0. Great. And we only expect our solution to be unique and, like, well, unique, so good. <laughs> around near the initial data, in some open interval containing x equals 0. But what's happening here is that if you go all the way down, if you try to use this solution all the way down to where x hits negative 3, so this would be the unique solution everywhere on the open interval from, from minus 3 to infinity. This is the unique solution to that initial value problem. However, if you allow yourself to hit a y value, the y value 0 so that you would run into the equilibrium solution, then suddenly you can pick up other solutions. And it looks silly to do what I'm going to do, but it's like what we did a minute ago. You can use the 0 solution if x is less than or equal to minus 3 and then pick up this solution, the 1 third x plus 1 cubed solution, if x is greater than or equal to minus 3. And again, you can include minus 3 both places because they agree. This function is differentiable. It satisfies this differential equation, and it satisfies this initial condition. Um, so this solution is unique near the initial data, but it becomes non-unique where you try to extend this to a y value where you run into an equilibrium solution, a y value that makes this right-hand side 0. So the, the moral of the story, I'll say it again, you really, you, ex, you hope to produce unique solutions near your initial x value, um, and maybe they're unique on the whole real line, but maybe they're only unique on open intervals containing initial x value. All right, um, let's look at one more example, and then we'll stop. Uh, the applications, a lot of the applications of differential equations are in the, the next section in the book. So let's just look at one more example of a separable equation. So let's look at dy dx equals y times the cosine of x. You should go ahead and record that there's an equilibrium solution where y is 0. You take, right, this is separable. It's dy dx equals some function of x times a function of y. And you need to look at where that function of y is 0. So one of those, or the only one, there's one equilibrium solution. y equals y of x is always zero. Great. And then aside from that equilibrium solution, you assume that y is not zero. You divide both sides by y. You multiply by dx. And you get this. You get 1 over y dy equals cosine of x dx. You integrate both sides. The integral of 1 over y dy, the natural log of the absolute value of y. I'll put the plus c on the other side. An antiderivative of cosine of x with respect to x, sine of x, plus c. 
If we couldn't solve algebraically for y, we would leave it in implicit form like this, but we can. You raise e to both sides, so you apply the exponential function to both sides. Um, so you get e to the natural log of the absolute value of y equals e to the sine of x plus c. The plus c is in the exponent, and that's extremely important. Okay, why did we do that? Because raising e to powers and taking natural log are inverse functions. And so e to the natural log of the absolute value of y is just the absolute value of y. So we get the absolute value of y equals, and then you split off an e to the c. If you multiply two numbers with the same base, the exponents just add. So um, we're doing that in reverse. This times this, you would add the exponents and get this. All right, we're trying to solve for y. We want to get rid of those absolute value signs. Well, if the absolute value of y is this, then y is plus or minus e to the c times e to the sine of x. But if c is just some real number, e to the c is just any positive real number, right? e to something can be any positive real number. So this is any positive real number, but then it's got a plus or minus in front of it. So plus or minus e to the c is any positive or negative real number. It can't be zero, um, but it could be any positive or negative number. So we get the solution. y equals, I'll just call it b. I'll just call this whole thing some new constant named b. Um, I don't know why I don't call it c again. Somehow when I factor off part of this and have like an e to the c, I like to not call it capital C again. Not that that would be bad. So you get this, where b could be anything positive or negative. But if we let b be 0, then we get the equilibrium solution, which is a solution. So can, do we get a solution when b is 0? Yeah. So in fact, if you want to write the general solution to this differential equation, you don't have to split it into cases. Yes, there's the equilibrium solution. And there's this solution where b is not 0, but the equilibrium solution is what you get if you let b be 0. So um, what this means is the general solution to this, both cases, just give you that y equals b e, oops, b e to the sine of x. And so you just write the general solution in this one form. because it includes both cases. So that's the general solution to this differential equation. All right, um, those were some examples of separable equations. The solving separable equations goes just like this. The function of y that you get can be almost arbitrarily bad, so that it could be impossible to solve for y. Of course, in my examples, I could solve for it, but in other problems, you might not be able to, and you just leave your answer in implicit form. All right, we'll do quite a few applications in the next section.